All right. Well, I think we're all on together now, and we're live streaming. And so we will see uh, people begin to join off and on. But the reality is that a lot of people end up watching the recordings at their leisure, right? So, so all of this is being recorded. Um, so what we're here to talk about uh, is this issue of increased automation and how we can work to make sure that the human stays front and center, right? Um, we, we have essentially uh, arrived at a divergent moment in time where we are either going to spend more and more and more of our time interfacing with machines or we're going to you know, use machines to spend more time interfacing with each other, right? I would like to do the latter, but that does not seem to be the trend right now. Uh, and so each of us is working in our way to, to push artificial intelligence and the use of robotics and automation and, and technology in general. But I think we need to take a hard look at how we consciously endeavor to keep the human and the human's needs and, and, and what I like to call like, you know, natural intuitive interaction as our goal. And we have a great panel today here where you know, each of you is going to introduce sort of your uh, role. Uh, I'm going to let you kind of uh, go around in a circle. Uh, we'll begin with uh, Colonel Manuel Ugarte, and uh, and then we'll kind of go go around. But Ma Manuel, why don't you kick us off? Yeah. Well, thank you for having me here today, folks. Uh, I'm, I'm ecstatic to be part of this panel. So uh, my name is Manuel Ugarte. I'm a I'm lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army. Uh, been working in science and technology, uh, science and technology for quite some time. I met Dave last decade, uh, working on autonomous vehicles and workload and human human machine teaming. So this is an area of, of, of passion of mine. And now looking into the ethical perspective of how we interact with machines is something that we definitely have to continue to have at the forefront. So most recently, I've been working with a new army startup. Uh, a company is called the Army Futures Command, where we're seeking uh, innovative technologies to modernize the Army. Uh, one of those technologies is autonomous vehicles, ground vehicles, and uh, aerial platforms and so forth. Uh, so that kind of brings us uh, back into the crossroads with Dave and, and the robotics uh, uh, piece. So uh, right now, I'm a fellow with uh, Microsoft uh, Mixed Reality government uh, team where we're looking at now, not just to, to, to make this a little bit more complicated, it's how we interact with our robotic platforms, mixed reality, and the human uh, in the loop, or that. Uh, so, but ethics, again, comes to the forefront, and, and we, I'm, I'm pretty glad to be part of this conversation right now. Thank you. All right. Hey. Alex, Alex. Alex. Okay, sure. Yeah, great to be with you today. And yeah, a little bit about my background and journey. Um, I was a co-founder and CTO of a machine learning startup in the IoT space where um, we use machine learning to predict and prevent equipment failure. Um, and like a lot of oil and gas facilities where, you know, these failures could be the catastrophic outcomes like the Gulf oil spill. And, you know, there's this massive amount of sensor data that came online. So we were able to capitalize on that. And um, we built that company up and went through the full life cycle and ended up uh, selling it in 2016. And since then, um, I've been really interested in the potential for AI for, um, for, you know, sort of for good. And one particular thread is the idea of augmented intelligence, which is AI, not just for AI, but actually how do we augment our human faculties and, you know, how, does, how do humans augment AI? How do we kind of get a whole greater than some of the parts and um, I think um, it's, there's a lot of interesting ethical questions, but augmentation is one sort of sub consideration under the umbrella of autonomy and look forward to discussing that uh, today and being on All And part of regard, you want to go next? Sure, Last I can do. Yeah, also for me, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me to join. Very curious to, 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 to listen in and to, of course, uh, participate in the debate. So, yeah, my name is uh, Pepe Garneset, and I'm the CEO of uh, CMR Surgical, which is a surgical robotics business headquarters, also uh, Cambridge in the UK. 
And we had a strong mission to basically bring keyhole surgery to as many people around the world as absolutely possible. When I joined uh, CMR, I came from having been the uh, managing director of ABB's robotic business for quite some time. So I also have quite a lot of experience in how sort of the industrial world really work on full automation in the automotive industry and, for instance, the electronic industry. But then coming back a bit to the, my current role as CMR, we are delivering then Versus, which is a surgical robotic system, which is then used for robotic keyhole or minimal access surgery. I mean, the different names on the same thing. And, but what I think is important and the difference to, to um, the industrial side is that that is a master slave system. So there is kind of no automation where the surgeon still really remains in the center of what we, what we do. And in our industry, as in many, most other industries, there is a lot of hypocalls, a lot of interest in the AI or machine learning. Uh, but I think it is important somehow that we separate the fact from fiction. And uh, um, I, I think it's important also to note that automation is not something that are something we probably expect to see very immediate within surgery, because I think it is really the is all really the question about the duty of care. And I think the main question we very often see is that who is really ultimately responsible for uh, the patient uh, uh, in the end. But there is definitely a big uh, role and opportunities for AI and machine learning. And I think the biggest part is really about all the data by introducing robotics into the surgery. We really are able to um, collect and analyze a lot of data. And with machine learning, we can really standardize surgery and by that sort of giving better patient uh, care. But there is also one more potential, slightly difficult here on this, that uh, data is very sensitive within the healthcare industry, uh, really, how can we use it? But I'm pretty sure as we see clear benefit both for the hospital, for the patient and for the surgeon, so I'm pretty sure we're going to see significant uptake of uh, AI and machine learning also in the, in the healthcare. So, yeah. thanks a lot. Thank you. And in absolute perfect timing, Julie has demonstrated once again that she <laughs> will never let us down. She is our fifth speaker. I guess technically our fourth speaker if I'm the moderator. Uh, so thanks for rounding out our team here, Julie. And uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, so I'm Dr. Julie Merble. I'm currently a senior scientist at the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab. And my research focus is on human machine teaming and collaboration, especially human machine autonomy and trust. I'm really interested in questions about not only how do you, you know, objectively measure trust, but what does a system, an AI or a machine need to do in order to be trustworthy, and that's a very different concept from just being seen as reliable or understanding uh, why it behaves as it does. Thank you. So we've got people from all different kinds of AI and automation world. Uh, I personally am right now uh, doing two different sort of very complementary things. One is I'm CEO of Weightless, which is providing micro-positioning and robotic solutions. And the other is I'm actually using that core technology in the automotive sector through a company called Nextroid. Um, and, and that is a way to, to actually not only improve autonomous driving, but also ADAS driving and ultimately uh, the InsureTech that is, is, is really looking to, to have a big impact on, you know, our, not only how we do automotive insurance, but ideally to eventually improve our roads, provide better feedback and, and ultimately ground truth, right? So, so obviously an area that's near and dear to my heart, but is also just tremendously um, hyped in the news is this autonomous driving and uh, what is often called, you know, adaptive driver assistance. And so I wanted to kind of pose the fundamental question in light of some new data that has just come out. So Forbes just did an article uh, showing some of the recent data from the big automotive companies. So the big automotive companies have been saying for a while, hey, you know, we're investing billions to make you safer. 
And we're providing all these different technologies like lane change assist and, and predictive braking. And in some cases, like Tesla, you know, so-called autonomous driving, right? Um, well, now the data is in and there are two things that we've seen. Uh, the, in the Forbes article, it points out that safety has not improved, <laughs> right? So, so they're not actually making cars safer. And the second thing is that when we look at, um, you know, issues of like greenhouse gas emissions, uh, congestion, we haven't made that better either, right? So there's been no improvement functionally, um, which is kind of amazing, right? Because here we are 10 years into uh, these, these multi-billion dollar investments and we're not yet seeing that so-called, you know, AI is improving the actual current lives of the humans around us, right? Um, and so the question is, why is that? Well, in the case of, you know, some of these systems, what we're finding, and I won't name particular, you know, car companies, because I think honestly it's true for all of them, um, the potential benefit is not being reaped because there hasn't been enough attention to um, balancing appropriately the human and the machine input. You know what I'm saying? And so you get fights for control. You also get very basic mode changing problems. If a car is driving autonomously and doing a pretty darn good job and you're watching, you know, Netflix, it's very difficult to go from watching Stranger Things to the accident that is exactly 0.76 seconds ahead of you, right? Um, that is a Stranger Thing, right? The, the collision that you're about to have with the big white truck in front of you, right? So, so ultimately, this isn't a hypothetical issue. This isn't a, an academic or a pedantic issue. This is a, an issue that's affecting, you know, every human being who's trying to get around. Like, if you're a human being that needs to move, well, this is an important issue. If you're a human being who needs healthcare and you're going to, you know, undergo robotic surgery, this is an immediate issue. Um, so I want to pose, now that I've kind of introduced the topic, hopefully in a way that we all understand. Uh, I wanted to pose some questions to each of you, and I'm not going to single you out, but I kind of want to uh, just sort of open things up for, uh, for discussion. So I want each of you to sort of tell me in your experience, what, what does it mean to be human-centered? And then give me, you know, an example uh, from your experience and, and sort of help bring that to life. Uh, so that so that the rest of the folks can kind of understand the experience that you that you had, and feel free also to give me both a positive or a negative experience. Um, so I'll open that up. I'll go first. Um, so I think your question gets to one of the most critical issues that I'm seeing in in the development of autonomous systems, which is this belief that we can engineer the human out of the system. And that uh, if the human does have to have a role, then we can simply train him or her to do their job. And I think that that belief is misguided at best because the human is always going to be a consumer of the autonomous system. The human is always going to be the one actually get the, the autonomy to do a thing or receiving the information it, it gets. And in order to actually be human centered, the system needs to take into account the human's role and actually admit that, you know, the engineers actually have to admit that the human is going to have a role within the system. And so if we're going to build autonomous systems, if we're going to allow you know, it's driverless cars to be on the roads, then right now what we're saying is, well, the car can drive itself, but when things go wrong, then the human is going to take over. But we know from cognitive psychology that it takes upwards of 200 milliseconds to assess the situation and take back over. And if you're going at 60 miles per hour, how far can you actually travel in that two in that just small 200 millisecond window what we actually need to do is consider enabling these machines to assess the human state and to apprise the human of what's going on well ahead of time but even in that case it's still kind of silly to assume that the human is going to be able to take over in an emergency because they are quite probably in the back of the winnebago making a sandwich to to 
you know, quote the apocryphal joke. And so what we need to then do is start thinking about the legalities issues and the ethics issues that are consummate with include with having autonomous systems on the road. So if you are driving, if you're riding in an autonomous car and you are in an accident because it is not possible for the human to take over in that 200 millisecond period, who's responsible for that? And I think it's not just or fair to say that the human is going to be responsible in that case because it's not it's not a possible event. That, I, I like to I like to keep you I like to keep you on on that because when you're looking at excuse me, it's my son here today. I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, so I like to I like to kill that guy. He's my robotics uh, guy. So um, I like to kill that. What is your favorite food, okay. guys? Um, sorry. All righty, school is off. All right. So I like to kill on that because I, I, I want to think about when do we need to outsource our decision making and then bring them going. Where, like for example, different instances of an accident. Or if there's an accident that is going to happen, so maybe they can't choose between a group of people, a handful of people, or causing harm to the driver to avoid hitting those two groups. Where is that decision? Where is that dilemma? How is that dilemma can get resolved within an ethic perspective? Are we going to just relay that to a, to a machine to make a decision? Or that's when human needs to be the one in, in the loop because that's the one that has to make that decision. We're not going to uh, outsource. That, uh, that outcome to the coder, uh, you know, but uh, anyhow, that's, that's an example. It can be an, an extreme case. I can see that a case happening in surgical robotics, perhaps, where there's going to be a, a, a crossroads where are we going to, are we going to outsource our, our ethical decision making to code or to the human to make that step? I don't think we're there yet. We can, we can certainly make a bunch of rules for it. But I don't know if, if creating a bunch of is actually the, uh, the, uh, the, the solution to this is, is, is I yeah. don't think we're there yet. Uh, I think you're absolutely right because they can't answer the trolley problem and trying to hard code rules, you're going to end up with a very, very brittle system. And perhaps bias because the culture may be normalized to those rules where here in the United States may be a, a set of those that we are more prone to, let's say, uh, we, if there's, there's going to be any regulated autonomous vehicles, may, we may not be inclined to, I'm just using a hypothetical, we may not be inclined to purchase that, that, that vehicle, which in, in, in that, if we go through that logic, may prevent us from perhaps diminishing accidents, because we're claiming that the autonomous vehicles will help us diminish the, the probability of accidents, even though the data doesn't show that. But, uh, but we're looking at the evolution of technology. If we go to Europe, they may just, you know, maybe take a different perspective on those regulations. But again, that's just a, a case to, to, to chew on that. And I can, if I, I mean, I can try to take sort of two sides of it. I think, I mean, if you just follow up on the, uh, on what you just mentioned on the uh, surgical robotic, I think that there is, There'll be a long, long time before we will see completely autonomous uh, uh, surgery going on. Uh, there will be people saying that they don't believe in that at all, and I think there are some who believe that yeah, that could happen, of course, uh, further down the road. If I'm moving it over to areas like in the automotive industry, where many of the large companies really struggle by oh, actually finding employees who are willing to do the, the dull dirty, dangerous, and delicate jobs. I mean, there is not even a choice. They actually need to, find, to actually use AI machine learning together with robotics in order to actually be able to perform the automation needed for actually keeping the, the, the industry uh, more or less uh, rolling. But they're also there, I don't, haven't really seen, I mean, if I go, if I go six, seven, eight years ago, there was a lot of debate about robots taking away or killing jobs. My experience has really been that, as I said, today, so many of the large companies are actually struggling to find people who want to do the job because the jobs has been elevated. And uh, today's generation, 
don't want those jobs. They really want to do more meaningful uh, kind of tasks. So I think there are different different areas, and I think somewhere we will see it, and somewhere we will not see it. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that. I think um, when I think of human centered, I think of um, almost the opposite of most modern day AI. <laughs> And I say that as an actual developer of AI technology, because most investor business models are focused on automation, cost reduction, cost elimination. It's low hanging fruit. It's the easiest one to justify. And, uh, you know, human centered is really an afterthought for the most part from what I see. We have tools like this, which are um, probably at best a distraction and at worst sapping us of the one creative impulse that we have, which puts us ahead of synthetic computer intelligence. So I think, you know, we're, we're almost further handicapping ourselves with technology as opposed to really augmenting ourselves with human centered. And to give a specific example from oil and gas, you know, you had, uh, you had people in the loop, you had mechanical engineers maintaining equipment, then upstream of that, you had like design and reliability engineers. And for the most part, um, the technology, the, the good side was that the predictive kind of alerting engine could help them prioritize which things to look at. But the, in the, and there was a rush to autonomous optimization for a period of time. And what they discovered is, you know, these sort of closed loop optimizers would over optimize one area and things would kind of go off the rails. And they ended up shutting a lot of them down in these refineries. And where people excel is like, we discover where you've over optimized in one thing, you know, things that are hard to sort of put into a model, but we kind of instinctively know, oh, this is, this is not, this is going too far. We need to like take a pause and go upstream and look at maybe the design of the system uh, and not just let it run in this sort of, you know, let, let a model run where it, it goes off the rails. So, I mean, I think um, that's an example where, you know, we could do better if we get the best of both worlds, if we can set up a human centered system to let, let us excel what we're getting at and let the computer excel what it's at. I think that would be uh, you know, an optimal design. Yeah, and I think just add on to what you're saying, I think that part of the question too is, is the purpose of the autonomy or the AI to make the roads safer or is it, or is there another part of that road? I mean, if they're just as good or if they're better in different parts of driving, like if you're on a cross country trip, you know, after 10, you know, four hours of driving, are they better then? But is the role of the autonomous system to be better than people or is it actually just to offload the workload and to be as good at? Um, but I think also what you're saying, Alex, is critical. I don't think the human role is often considered at the conception of of the machine. It's it's like exactly what you said, slapped on at the end. And we're not going to have human centered systems if we say, oh, well, we can just train the human to do it at the end or, yeah, we'll make a GUI for that. So. Yeah, well, I want to take on a bring up. Well, first of all, thank you guys for, for sharing your your thoughts on on this important topic. Is really to me, it's it's all about how to bring it down to people's experiences. And you guys are all experts, so I, I really believe that this kind of um, uh, you know opportunity at Horasis is like this uh, great way to take our you know hard won knowledge and experience and and share it. You know, I think that is very human <laughs> to want to share these these um, these understandings and experiences. Um, but at some point, we have to shift from from the anecdotal and the stories to to metrics. And one of the things that I've been finding as I look at the automotive world is that it's stunning the amount of hype without a, a, what I would call demonstrated performance. And it's also amazing that we don't have better metrics for looking at these issues. And so, in the automotive world, you can say we don't have good metrics for looking at any element of human performance. Um, or, or system performance, uh, but it's especially painful when when you look at the, the the changes that occur often in fractures of a second um, between human control and and machine control, right? So you could say we we lack human robot interaction metrics in addition to lacking overall performance metrics. <laughs> so so we need both. Um, 
And, and nowhere is that more clear than when we look at automotive insurance, right? So to give people a little bit of perspective here, you know, a lot of the big insurance companies have said, oh, we're going to give discounts to safe drivers only to realize like, oops, what does that mean, right? And how do we measure it in practice? And oh, by the way, even if we do measure that well, now we also have to measure their interaction with a complicated AI machine. Do we hold it against them if they don't know how to you know, use AI? What if you have a theoretically high-performing AI and a theoretically high-performing human, but when you put them together, you get disaster? And who do you blame? It kind of is the human's fault if they don't know how to use the system, right? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, that is a very, you know, it's a, it's a very interesting theoretical question, but now it's actually a very pragmatic question for insurance actuaries who are trying to calculate if you were going to get in an accident, right? So let's talk a little bit about metrics. I want each of you to sort of give me your thoughts on where you have had to address, you know, metrics in AI. I know um, Colonel Lagarde actually in the military developed metrics for measuring my robots. So I know he's got a few things to say about that. And Julie, um, certainly, we published a lot of papers together on metricing human robot interaction. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, with Manny and and jump to Julie, and then hopefully uh, continue the discussion about metric. So I'll I'll put a thread on uh, on what Julie mentions and uh, and Alex mentioned about hey, let's put AI where it's best and let the humans do what they're best. And uh, using that as our baseline. Um, the things that really stuck with me, especially with our work that we did a few years ago okay, on workload mat maps, uh, we saw that in uh, use the crack box, for example, for bomb disposal, uh, having AI to assist on workload to maneuver uh, a vehicle through tight spaces or not to disturb the, uh, the environment, uh, having an AI application to help workload, it, it, it helps in extreme environments, it's already tired, stressed, uh, that's a good application for that that we've seen that is paying off dividends. Some of the work we've done as well on, on mine detection, high risk environments. So how we measure that, I, I think that we can definitely measure in some scale, high, medium, low, that's kind of something that really helps because it can be subjectively, subjectively suitable to assess how the human interacts with a robot and how that enhances emission set. So that's something that I experienced and and I believe that's definitely a, a way to go as we collect more data. Uh, I don't think we're going to get to over-optimize or over-correct the application of the technology as well as, you know, how you can, can do your mission. Uh, but I believe it's augmented by by, uh, by uh, an NI uh, partner. You know. Yeah, so it's, it's interesting because some of my recent work is actually then looking at human performance with autonomous systems and with AI. And actually to touch on what David mentioned in, in his question is you, I actually just uh, am in the middle of work right now where we have superhuman AI. They can play, they can do a relatively simple game um, at better than human levels. And we have people who can play the same game at very high levels. And when you team them up, they suck. Um, they just do terribly together. So, uh, and what I can tell you is it's also true when we are taking different artificial intelligences that can do this, that can play this game, but have been trained different ways or, or created in different ways. They also do poorly together. They do slightly more poorly together than when the human works with it. But then in addition, I'm involved in a program right now for DARPA where we're actually trying to objectively measure the trust of a human in an artificial intelligence in a complex critical task. Yeah. And the thing that keeps standing out to me is that it's not sufficient to just measure the workload of the human or understand their situation analysis uh, or their situation awareness, but actually to leverage that information and to provide to the AI the probability, the likelihood, and the manner in which the human is going to fail and allow the machine to step up and, and take advantage of that information, but also 
going beyond explainable AI, rather than just explaining why the machine is going to do whatever action it's going to take or what decision it makes, but to pr provide to the human an understanding of how likely the machine is to fail and consideration of this potential failure space. So when we build systems, we do test and evaluation and test and evaluation is actually a controlled, it's a controlled context, just like an experiment. And as soon as you take a machine, as soon as you take anything out of that test and evaluation context and put it in the real world, you are already closer to the failure boundary edge. And when we as people trust things, we trust them as a function of the context, we trust them as a function of the task, we less trust them as a function of capability because you do trust things that are not capable, but you trust them because you understand how they could fail and when they could fail. And that's the information that we need to provide. And that's one of the metrics that we need to figure out how to convey to human users and also about the human back to the machine so that it's not just the machine doing what the machine is good at and, what, and the human doing what the human is good at, but both of them complementing each other and recognizing when the other one is in a, in a potential failure sp state and being able to step up and act to support that. Yes, we are looking at uh, is when you when you look at how surgery has been performed in the past, obviously in the old days with really open surgery and uh, later with manual keyhole or manual lap. They were uh, very difficult to get some kind of standardization of the work done by the surgeon, but then by putting a robot in between the surgeon and the patient, we are actually able to collect a lot of data on um, how they are performing uh, the surgery inside the patient. We are able to measure hand movements or the controls uh in in, in 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 space and we can start actually to through relatively simple uh machine learning uh, algorithms then start to look at how can we standardize surgery and that is actually one of the areas where we are looking into it uh, in many ways as i say it is not a advanced ai at all but also, we are, of course, in a very regulated industry, and uh, there are quite a lot of limitations what we are allowed to do. So, but I think it's still a clear way of doing it, and that, in the end, is going to give better patient care, better patient outcome, and uh, even better safety for the patients in the end. Yeah, I, um, I love the question about metrics. I think that, um, you know, if you look at how often these systems are framed like in diagnostics, it's the human versus the AI, right? Like who has higher accuracy and in intelligence tests. And what's rarely done is looking at the composite sort of intelligence of the, the hybrid of both, because it's usually kind of positioned more adversarially. Um, and I think, you know, the one exception might be like autonomous cars, where at least, you know, when it's a crash, it's sort of, you know, there's an actual outcome there. But in more like knowledge worker domains, um, you know, I think um, it's often more ambiguous, like the ground truth and to think about what is the outcome we're measuring and how can we look at the combined contribution? Um, you know, when you're doing prediction, it's, it's often a little bit, it takes a while to determine you predicted it's going to fail. It's like predicting credit card fraud, uh, but even more uncertainty. You predict something's going to fail and then you do an intervention, it doesn't fail. And over time, you figure out you're reducing mean time between failure. But in general, what metrics can you use for you know the combined system? And and I personally think that if we start moving towards thinking about augmented systems, like let's look at the total performance instead of the human doctor versus the diagnostic or the the human versus the autopilot setting. Um, but you know, also to, to Julie's point, I think the current design probably doesn't optimally deal with handing handing off between the two. So you know, we need to think about that perspective too. Yeah, my last question, it really comes down to ethics, and maybe the most important question. Um, you know, I think there's such a push to, to use AI, and such a strong belief by all of us that AI can be a force for good. 
uh, one of the questions you know I've considered in the past with some of you is, you know, is it unethical to not use AI? Mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to human machine interaction, uh, we really don't have a good ethical framework for for discussing this. Intuitively, I would argue when you interact with an un, you know, an, an unbalanced system, it gives you heartburn. <laughs> like to use a a, a very vague phrase. Um, but how do we talk about that heartburn? How do we decompose that heartburn? And how do we do it in a way where we can actually assess corporations, assess governments, um, and certainly assess technologies, right? Um, so what do you guys think? Um, how do we create an ethical framework for talking about human machine interaction? To she, when, when we go about this, this answering this, this, this question, do we then understand where the society's baseline is? You know, that way, you know, and, and the way I, I say it is like sometimes, like going back to culture and, and social norms, uh, understanding what is acceptable within our society to also give us that, 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 that standard that will help us detect when we are off base on when we are aligned with with society. But again, now we're introducing technologies that are impacting society and going to continue to impact society in the future. So what what is it that society determines this, this is acceptable? So should we have a way to collect that data so we can start uh, norm detecting trends uh, of like uh, dilemmas or in, in the insurance uh, uh, industry? So we get to see how the trends are in, in similar like uh, cases uh, that, that could give us insights on how society understands certain things are, are normal. I don't know, that's just a, kind of like a, a, a wild idea to throw at you, <laughs> to throw at, at the team. What do you guys think? Yeah, I think, I, I think first of all, it's a very difficult, uh, it's a difficult topic to, to have, of course, and, and also probably to generalize across multiple industries and so, but I, my, my, my sort of simple take on it would be that as long as we, I mean, you mentioned that there's been spent a lot of energy, a lot of investments, a lot of time on trying to develop uh, autonomous cars and maybe so far without the great success in terms of getting things better. But if, we, if, if I flip that around, if we are to uh, enable better outcome uh, and if that is the aim and I, for me, that would be the aim if we can actually get, if we can improve performance uh, by introducing uh, AI, I actually, at least, it is a good starting point for saying why we should go ahead. But there is a, but there is a trick because I think if you're sitting on, like on, uh, I mean, sitting in also a few boards and uh, if you don't have a debate in a boardroom about AI, you, you, you are almost seen as you don't do your job. Uh, so there is sort of a super hype in, in, in pushing it forward. And I think it is important that, I think, uh, Julie, you mentioned it in the beginning, what is really the objective, uh, let's say, for autonomous car? Is it safety? Is it to make yeah. it easier? What, what is really the objective? And I think uh, it's probably put together with uh, somehow at least making it better or improve performance. I think the other part about it too goes to, um, you know, and we touched on this a minute ago, Manny commented that about X, you can't hard code a rule for an ethical situation. I mean, because then no matter what, there's always going to be an exception. But I think what we can do, and this is what we have looked at in work that I've done with R.L. Greenberg, but consideration of how to allow a machine to reason from the concept of harms. So there's a number of different ways a person can be harmed. They can be harmed physically, they can be harmed mentally, they can be harmed socially, they can be harmed, um, you know, maybe, maybe even ethically, um, legally, legal harms. And so if we could create a framework to allow the machine to reason about the harms that could p potentially that the person could potentially be exposed to by their action, that allows you a place to start to allow the machine to think about, you know, how should it how should it behave with the humans? 
But then the other side of that, and this goes to what I was talking about earlier, is if you've created a situation where you're saying that the human is responsible when they use the AI or the or the autonomous system, but there's no way they can intervene. We ourselves have created a system where that's that we're we're going to make it so people don't leverage AI or autonomous systems because they are then responsible for things they cannot control. Well, excellent, guys. Um, I'm going to open it up for for questions. We've got a few people in the audience. Happy to have you guys. Um, you can't speak, but you certainly can post comments. If you'd like to pose any questions to our esteemed panelists here, feel free. And... Uh, you know, if not, then I want to say thank you to each of my panelists for your contributions. This is always really fun and exciting to have a, a chance to share our thoughts. Uh, I do think there's a lot more that needs to be done. You know, I think one of the things I would say is you have some of the brightest minds in the world focusing on AI. And uh, we need to make sure that those bright minds are not only given a forum, but, but kind of channeled, right? We want to channel the energy in the best way. And I think keeping the human front and center is key. I see that Cam is, is posing a question. So let me turn it over to him and give him the mic. Hey guys, All right. I'm at the beach doing my walk, but I thought, uh, I really wanted to ask this question from the panel since I already know David. Um, could AI help driver become a better driver? And I'm not talking about just me driving my car. Imagine I wanted to drive a semi-truck and it requires a special license, but beyond license, it has a lot of tricks involved. Uh, can we have a type of assistant that is guiding me, maybe through a VR glass or something that it helps me uh, take this, you know, big machine and take it from point A to point B safely. Thank you. Yeah, Cam, thank you for the question. Uh, and thank you, you know, thank you for taking time from your uh, uh, walk on beach there to, to pose this very good question. <laughs> um, you know, I am absolutely passionate about this topic. So thank you, Cam, for asking it. I actually believe that long before we'll get societal benefit to actually, you know, level five autonomy, we have an opportunity to provide actionable feedback to humans. And that actionable feedback can be provided actually by taking the very same technology that was designed to slam on the brakes automatically, but look at when humans, you know, fail to brake appropriately and predictably. I think we can use it to alert humans when they do need to start predictably breaking. I think we can use it to look at how you know often people go over lane markers. But most importantly, we can look at the actual impact of your driving on the roadway. So for me, this is an opportunity to shift from ideology, which is what we've been doing in the past, to a true feedback loop. And, it, and it's interesting. In this case, it's a feedback loop that can be applied to autonomous driving, but it can also be applied to human driving. You know what I mean? In both cases, we want to know what the impact of, of driving is. Not in theory, but in practice. So, in other words, you could be driving under the speed limit, 